Our reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? This is the word of the Lord. My name is Carolyn Clausen, and I'm a member of the teaching team here at The Meeting Place. When my oldest son was in grade five, my husband, his dad, left our home. My kids' dad stayed actively involved in their lives, but mostly it was the two, my two sons and I that did most of life together. He left on April 30th, and weeks before I had purchased tickets to the Shrine Circus for May the 4th. The kids were looking forward to the circus, because what kid doesn't? But I didn't know if I could take them to that circus with that empty seat there glaring at me. I felt in my head like that empty seat would be screaming at me, he's gone and you're on your freaking own. I wasn't sure I had the inner strength to manage these two kids, driving downtown, parking, finding our seats. I had been a single mom for four days, and frankly, I was a basket case. But we had to go because the kids needed it. My church community saw me struggling, and they had asked me what they could do to help those first months. So I took a deep breath, and I asked my son's pod leader, that's the equivalent of Sunday school teacher, to come with us. I'm sure Dave thought it was very weird to support this little family by going to the circus, but he agreed. We went, and I think we all, we tried to have a good time, probably more than actually had a good time, but it was a good distraction from that achingly empty house that we would have otherwise found ourselves in. The kids' highlight of the evening was when the elephant pooped during intermission in the middle of the circus ring, and they needed a snow shovel and a full-size garbage can to clean it up. When you're a seven- and nine-year-old boy, anything about poop is going to be the highlight. Anyways, Dave was there for my boys. He and his wife, Doreen, looked after them several times that summer while I was working. They played hide-and-seek with them on the farm, they made them cute little boy snacks, and they let them f- drive the farm vehicles on the yard. Dave sought my boys out every time we went to church, and he chatted with them. My sons knew that Dave loved um, them, and his heart broke for them, and they felt it. That first fall, my oldest son got it in his head to give Dave a gift. Dave's favorite football player at the time was Milt Stiegel. He purchased a Bombers jersey with Milt Stiegel's number on it, When we found out where there was an open practice, and we parked, and we waited, and waited for it to end, and Mr. Stiegel was kind enough to sign it for us. Adam was so excited to give it to Dave. He literally spent his entire life savings on that jersey. As I recall, I had to pitch in the tax, because what boy calculates if they have enough for tax? When I think of incredible generosity, I think of Adam and this jersey. Dave was kind and generous, and it was, he was an incredible gift to my boys that summer. Adam wanted to acknowledge and honor Dave with this big-hearted, lavish expression of love. And Dave understood that this was o- no ordinary Stiegel bomber jersey. It was all the resources of a little boy who loved a man who came along when he needed him. I had a front row seat that summer to the stunning generosity God had created these two to be such beautiful characters, so good for each other. And Jesus invites us to approach faith as a child. And my child's generosity is something I will never forget. And it serves as an example to me. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. I like even more what Jesus doesn't say. He does not say, one day, if you're more perfect and try really hard, you'll be light. He doesn't say, if you play by the rules, cross your T's and dot your I's, then maybe you'll be light. No. He says straight out, you are light. It is the truth of who you are, waiting only for you to discover it. So for God's sake, don't move. No need to contort yourself to be anything other than who you are. It's from Father Gregory Boyle. My 10-year-old Adam was light in the world, in my world, It was a dark time in my life, and he shone his light bright. In a world of disappointment and betrayal, it mattered. This morning, we are talking about generosity and perspective and beauty and light. We are continuing our series looking at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, 
and Joel just read that passage um, that we are going to focus on this morning. This morning we're going to look at the way we look at the world with regards to light. When I was a kid, we sang a song about this, and I'm going to have you all stand up, and some of you might remember this, and some of you are going to learn it. So everybody stand up, and I want you to watch the video, and we're going to sing together. Follow along, okay? Play. Okay. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Good. Now, I saw some of you weren't doing the actions. Sorry. Okay, I accept your apology. We're going to try this again. Everybody do the actions. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father of above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Some of you remember that song? It sort of feels funny to have a song that shakes a finger to kids, right? So some of you... Uh, most of us have grown up sort of thinking about this sort of way that when what you see inf impacts what goes on inside. So if you look at things that are light, you'll be filled with light. And if you look at things of darkness, you'll be filled with darkness. That's how we know vision works, right? That's why that song makes sense to us. But it's really since only about the 16th century that we have looked at light this way, or that vision. So if we look in, at this text in light of this, that's how we're going to be tempted to read it. But that is not how Jesus meant it when he was talking to the audience in front of him. That's not how his audience saw vision. And perhaps they knew something that we have lost sight of. In the culture of the day, for the people that Jesus is speaking to, the lamp was inside of the person, and what was seen was shaped by what that internal light that was inside. Proverbs 29, verse 13 says, the poor and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives sight to the eyes of both. That's what we read, but what the actual Greek, if you go a little bit more clearly, it will say, the Lord gives light to the eyes of both. And when we go to Psalms, when the psalmist was really struggling and in time of darkness, my heart pounds, my strength fails me, even the light has gone from my eyes. I could share another dozen texts where it's about light being given to the eyes, shining out through the eyes, on, on and on. The thinking of the day was this. What we see is lit from the inside. Eyes had this type of fire, and this light or this fire was a source of power. Sight was a function of moral light, and what the, the moral attitudes of the heart flowed out from that light. For the people that Jesus was speaking to, the eye was a way for people to see the character of the person. When you saw what they saw, you could see who they were and where their heart was. Our perspective shapes our vision. It just does. And do you see even now how the perspective I just gave you on the way folks in biblical times saw vision and how they see it differently than we do? Do you see how that changes our perspective of this text that we're going to look at today? One summer, back in the days when we still used separate GPS devices, I was out of town on a summer road trip, and I, when I made a wrong turn, the device would say, recalculating, recalculating, in a way that was kind and sympathetic, and I could just hear it say, oops, Carolyn, you goofed. Let me figure it out, and I'll get you right back on track. I could just hear it. It took me almost a week before I remembered that the previous summer, same device, different trip, when I heard that word, I heard it as recalculating, recalculating, in a way that mocked me, and he was irritable. I could just hear how the intended message was, you idiot, weren't you listening to me? You just screwed up. When I thought about the two ways I heard this message, it made me laugh. It was the same computerized voice, but my internal light was very different. And it had me wonder how I might see all sorts of situations throughout the day in light, pun intended, 
of how much light I have inside of me. On darker days, I look at comments made by somebody at the dinner table in a grumpy way and I get defensive and adversarial. But in a moment when I'm filled with light, I might hear that same comment and I can get curious and we can have this really cool conversation that will really connect us. Has this ever happened to you? You know what I'm talking about, right? So have you thought about how your internal light, how bright or how dim, how that shapes how you see the world and how then you interact with the world? So in biblical times, in the wider culture, there was this shorthanded way of acknowledging that the light comes from within. And so people would say, does that person have a good eye or a bad eye? Or sometimes they called it an evil eye. That was sort of the way they talked about it. The good eye in our text was, is ophthalmus haplus, right? Where we know opth ophthalmology, like we know that to be eyes. And haplus was good eye. So haplus is liberally and generously. Haplus sometimes is pure and undivided and clear. That's a, as opposed to diplus, and when we, someone has diploplia, they see double. Um, and so haplus is about being very pure and singular, um, and just sort of very having a lot of integrity. So in Proverbs 22, verse 9, the generous will, share them, will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. It actually says whoever has a bountiful eye, or a haplus, a thalmos haplus, will be blessed, for he shares his bread with the poor. So it was looking at when you have a good eye, then you're generous. That's as opposed to ophthalmos poneros. I hope I say that right. If anybody knows the original Greek, pretend I didn't just goof it up. Um, which is the eye of evil, grievous, bad, wicked, malicious. It's sort of all about being nasty. In the parable of the workers in the vineyard, you might recall that Jesus tells the story of workers being invited very early in the morning to work a full day in the vineyard, and then they get paid a day's wage. Then others are invited at 9, at noon, at 3, and some even at 5, an hour before quitting time, come and I will pay you. And at the end of the day, the people that started last get paid first, and they get paid a day's wage. So the guys that were there for 12 hours, they get paid the same as the guys that got paid one. And they are mad. They do not think it's fair, and they confront the owner of the vineyard. And the vineyard says, don't I have the right to do, the vineyard owner says, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? And that envious is actually translated, is, is your eye bad? Is it ophthalmus so paneros? Is your eye bad because I am good? The bad eye cannot see the beauty of grace. And it doesn't have the brightness of generosity. It doesn't see the beauty of others receiving generously as something to treasure that will be witnessed and enjoyed. The bad eye has the culture of scarcity. More for you means less for me. So here's the challenge. Our eyes too often look at it, the world in a stingy way, not a generous way. How do we shine, like put the shine on the glass so that the light can come through that lamp um, internally so that generosity shines out bright? And it's really a change of perspective. For many years, I have volunteered with the Occupational Therapy School at the U of M to take on students as they have practicums in the community. Students are placed in nonprofit organizations and after months in the classroom, they learn by doing and the organization gets the benefit of them doing work for six or eight weeks. And for several years, um, I supervised students at Silo Mission, a homeless shelter here in Winnipeg and they run a variety of programs. And it was pretty early on in the placement, as students were getting their feet wet, that they were expected to spend a day in the MOST program, which is a program that helps beautify the city, the streets of Winnipeg, which is really about picking up garbage. That's a very long day of a mindless task. So they would have this full, hard, hot day for the students. And I knew it would change them, because it did every year. The employees, they were former or current homeless folks, many with a history of addiction. They'd had a rough life and they looked the part. But as the students heard their stories, they moved from judgment at the way they had carried those burdens to awe at what they had had to carry. They came to understand that these folks had such great challenges and had overcome so much to get to where they were. They could see addiction as a pain management strategy for people who had been exposed to things too horrific to speak of. They saw resilience instead of homelessness. They witnessed the inherent dignity of these men 
and by extension to the patrons of Silo Mission in a way that they absolutely could not prior to hearing the stories of these men. The light in them changed and they, their eyes saw the work that they were doing completely differently. For the rest of their time at Siloam, they partnered with the patrons. They heard their ideas and they co-created these cool projects. Inevitably, the students became convinced that they received far more from the people they served than they would ever be able to reciprocate. They moved from judgment and stinginess to generosity and compassionate respect. And they admitted this light that was just beautiful for me to witness. Matthew 29, or sorry, Matthew 9, verse 27 to 31 is a story of a blind man begging for vision. They ask Jesus for sight. Now it's really important to note that this story happens later in the chapter and that there are multiple stories earlier in the chapter where people in power are ticked off with Jesus because he's hanging out with the undesirables and he's enjoying great times of food and fellowship with them when he, they think that he should rather be in pious fasting. It's no coincidence that the story of the men's desire to see happens in a chapter where so many folks who think they are sighted are actually blind to the ministry and mission of Jesus. They couldn't see what Jesus saw, and they are critical of him. So the story is told, as Jesus went on from there, the two blind men said, have mercy on us, son of David. And Jesus says, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they say, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done to you, and their sight was restored. Now what's really cool is that according to your faith, let it be done to you, in the message it's translated as, become what you believe. Isn't that beautiful? Become what you believe. Those blind men did, and their sight was restored. And it would seem to be a lesson to those who, earlier in the chapter, were looking so dimly at Jesus' relationships. It was a challenge of sorts for them to lose their blindness too. They thought they could see, but the light wasn't inside of them. They hadn't become what they believed. Jesus invites us all to have this light inside of us so that we can see the world the way God does. I don't know, people, but it feels so simple, and yet this is literally the challenge of our lives. Become what you believe. To have my, eye, my inside become what I believe when I can actually figure out how to make that happen, I move from being blind, like stingy or envious or greedy, and when I can see how God sees loving and compassionate and beautiful, then that just impacts everything and it just flows out of me in a very natural way. Can you just imagine how much richer life is when you can see the way God sees things? So in 2003, Oprah handed out boxes to a room full of carefully selected women. Circumstances in their lives had created huge challenges and hard times in their life. And Oprah explains to her audience that as she passes out these boxes, one will have a key, and whoever gets the box with the key will win a car. Watch. Everybody in the audience, now listen to me carefully, is being given a special package, and I don't want you to open it. Do not open it. Cameras are on you, so do not open until I tell you. All right, open your boxes. Open your boxes. One, two, three. You get a call. You get a call. You get a call. That video makes me smile every time, every time. The energy when everyone discovers that they get a key and Oprah is yelling, you get a car and you get a car. So here's the thing, Jesus says, you get the light, you get the light, you get the light, everybody gets the light. We, all are, we are all invited to the party. And don't you just wanna become what you believe to have this incredible light inside of you that shines out onto people? So simple and so hard in the same moment. Not complicated, but a lifetime of long discipleship to work towards this. I'd like to let you in on how I conceptualize this, letting you in on an approach to therapy that has become really, for me, an approach to my life. I'm gonna give you a very quick lesson on internal family systems, IFS, which is a model of therapy that was developed by Dr. Richard Schwartz. 
In my work, I feel like I do my best work as a therapist when I allow that which is created in the image of God in me to shine into a situation. And my experience is, is that I, if I can be present with this imageness when relating to somebody who's anxious or scared or angry or hurt, then they can come to discover that which is created in the image of God in them. So say initially, a client comes in saying, why am I so mad at my child? Help me get rid of my anger. And that person spe was spending time with, with what is created, that which is created in the image of God in me, then rediscovers hers. And she can come to say, this kid of mine pushes the same buttons, the very same buttons as that bully on the schoolyard did when they picked on me when I was a kid. I feel just as out of control and picked on now as I did then. And the judgment at themselves and the anger they have dissipates, and we are able to work on their feelings for their child in a completely different and far more effective way. They get unhooked from their anger, and they can feel that, and they can heal it. And they are no longer trying to get rid of that anger or push it down. They comfort themselves, and they're calmer, and they have less need to yell at their child. Another example. A client comes in upset with how he is doing so much more than his share of the housework and how his wife gets, go, gets to go away on weekends and he just has to stay home with some work in session rather than being a guy resentful of how his spouse takes advantage of him. He discovers and develops a compassion for the part of him that has been raised to allow people to exploit his goodwill and he allows himself to be taken advantage of. He has greater clarity around how he doesn't speak up for what he needs and he develops a newfound understanding for his marriage. He emerges more courageous to speak up for himself, knowing that when he does, it will be a better relationship for he and his wife both to enjoy. So this model of therapy says that we have parts that are upset and hurt and scared and mad, and so they either A, create all sorts of drama and chaos, or B, find ways of locking things away where you push it down and pretend it's not there still bubbles up. And these are the parts that create problems for a person in their lives and in relationships. And that's why people come to me for therapy. But we also have this core, beautiful, whole self inside of us. Jennifer Reimersma in her books, All Together You, talks about the God image inside of us, this Amago Dei, which is like the fingerprint of God. And I often think of it as that which is created in the image of God in me. It's the light that God longs to give each of us. And this light changes our perspective. It changes the people that we shine on um, as we encounter them. Let me explain. If I can allow that which is created in the image of God in me to be fully present and fully turned on, then the person I am with finds their truest, best self. Their imago Dei emerges, that which is created in the image of God in them. That light inside is healing for them. The hurting people who sabotage themselves and wound others, they move towards healing. These are the miracles that I have the privilege of having a front row seat to every week when I do my work. There's this thing I do when some parts of me start feeling something that isn't part of God's light. Let's say, for example, a client gets really loud and there's a part of me that gets frightened. Or let's say that a client tells me a story again and again and maybe for the fifth time and I might start to feel impatience rising up. I notice that part, and I am aware of it, and I work to love myself as I love my neighbor. That's what God asks us to do. I notice that part, I acknowledge it, and I ask it to step back, so that which is created in the image of God can then lead. There we go. I'm not mean to it, because there's a reason that it's there, and I want to show that light and compassion and love to that part as well. But it's best if that part that wall doesn't drive my soul bus, right? How do I know when I'm relating to another person with the God light inside of me? I check to see if I'm feeling towards that other person and then also towards myself, with that all that is in light with the character of God. So I know that I am with a person, that I'm with a person with that which is created in the image of God in me when I'm living in the eight C's. This is part of that model. This is the character of God. First of all, curious. God asks questions. Do you ever hear how many questions Jesus asked and invited? Got curious as opposed to judgmental. 
compassion, where he looks underneath the other person's behavior to see the pain and to see the loveliness of the other person. Courageous. This is about being ready to have the hard conversations, to be kind, to ask the tough stuff, to go where it's hard, instead of being nice and playing it safe. Connection. God is in relationship with us. God is in relationship with God, Father, Son, Spirit. He invites us to deeper connection with others. Clarity, which is about big picture thinking, where you're able to kind of take a step back and notice what's happening. Hmm, my reaction kind of seems outsized to what's really happening here. I wonder what's going on inside of me. Then there's calm. God doesn't panic. He doesn't need to. He's got it. And so can we. We might not know how something is going to go, but we can take a deep breath and we can stay present. Then there's confidence. God is the one who said, let there be light. And there was. Any one of us can trust that we can move forward and speak into a situation and know that even though we don't know how it's going to end, we will find a way through because we don't go in alone. And creativity. God made aardvarks and centipedes. He is creative. And that same power lives in us. When we are in a jam, we can take a deep breath and we can not just look at sort of this or that, but we can look at option C, D, or E. This is the fingerprint of God, the Imago Dei, that we all have inside of us. So I have years of training that allows me, I think, to be fairly effective to, to inhabit this in the therapy room. But I will tell you, it's a whole lot easier to sit in the space of the eight season session than in my kitchen when I'm hungry and people are tired and the dishwasher hasn't been emptied yet and the leftovers that I was gonna zhuzh up for supper, I found out that my husband ate them for lunch. <sighs> then for sure, that which is in the image of God in me is covered by parts that are annoyed and upset, angry and frustrated. I am not my best self. I may not be able to, in real time, notice that my parts are getting all bossy and up in Jim's grill in time to have them take a step back. However, over time, I can work it through, and I can look at the parts that were there blocking the light, maybe in the hours after, and I can work into living into all those seas again. And I do that by shining my light onto those parts so that they can take a step back and then my light can come through. Then I can own my harsh words. I can apologize for them and I can start fresh. I can feel my light shine brighter and I actually feel like this is who I really am. This is what I was created to be. I'm working just like all of us are in life to notice that when I behave out of alignment with my light, um, then I can be the light to those parts of me that were acting out. So I'm in a better place to be light to others. This is the work of discipleship, this uncovering the light and doing the healing work so that we can become what we believe. To shine that light is a gift to the world. And it's a gift to ourselves too. The light of Christ inside of you changes the world as you live in it, as you live in it, and then as you live out the qualities of God in us. What was true of Adam as he gave Dave the bomber jersey is true of you too. Believe it. Jesus says, you, you are the light of the world. I like even more what Jesus doesn't say. He does not say one day, if you are more perfect and try really hard, then you'll be light. Mm -mm. He does not say if you play by the rules, cross your T's and dot your I's, then maybe you'll become light. Oh no. He says straight out, you are light. It is the truth of who you are, waiting only for you to discover it. So for God's sake, don't move. No need to contort yourself to be anything other than who you are. Amen. So, first question. I love your statement that perspective shapes our vision. I am in serious need of a change of perspective. What can I do to get started? Hmm. Well, you came this morning. <laughs> um, I think that just coming to be together and listening and finding a line in a song or listening to a prayer, hearing Christine, I think all of that can, it just takes one little phrase to sort of turn our perspective often. We just have to be present and wait for it to show up. 
Um, I talked about those eight C's, and I think often I'm like, so which one am I missing? Which one is hard? And then what can I do to try to specifically get that one back? Am I being particularly judgmental, or am I, have I lost all clarity on this? Can I go talk to someone to get some clarity? And so often I'll do a check with those eight C's to, as to sort of figure out what my homework is. Okay. That's really great. Thank you for that. Um, there was a comment about TMP handing out boxes with ribbons on our way out today, but I just didn't want anybody to be disappointed at the door, unless you've made an arrangement I don't know about. I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> just wanted to clear that up. That's awesome. Um, you, you used this line, so simple and yet so hard. You shared some great examples from your workplace, helping people to see. Is that what made the interactions with Jesus so powerful? He truly saw people created in the image of God. Can we learn how to see people in that way? Oh, I hope so. I just, I think, I, it just comes back to me again and again how at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, before he does anything public, he gets baptized. And God comes from the heavens and says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And he just reminds him of his belovedness. And right after that, he goes off to be tempted. And he's got this moment where he can hold on to how he was held as beloved. And I think so often when people, when they lose sight of their belovedness is when they get off track. And when they can be with somebody or they can find scripture or a song that reminds them of their belovedness, it just brings them back home to who they really were created to be. Mm -hmm. And that image of God in them just whoop. Yeah. I don't know how you type that out. But. So simple and yet so hard. <laughs> so, so simple and yet so hard. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Would you close our service? Thank you. Would you stand with me to be blessed? In ancient times, when a person would give a blessing, they would hold their hands out. And when you would receive a blessing, you would hold your hands out. Listen, God, your light is the commen commencement and culmination of creation. From now until forever, you are the light of life. And God, you invite us to walk in your light and to become lights to the world as we do so. God, Jesus, revive our hearts to sing. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Go with the light of Christ on you and in you this week. Amen. <laughs>